Today, President Biden is weighing options for how to respond to this weekend's deadly drone attack on a small U.S. outpost in Jordan. The White House blames Iranian-backed militant groups. The regime in Tehran denies any involvement. President Biden is vowing to retaliate, but to do so in a way that avoids an even wider regional conflict. We'll respond and we'll respond, um, you know, in a very uh, uh, consequential way. But we don't seek a war with, with Iran. We're not looking uh, for a wider conflict in the Middle East. In fact, every action the president has taken has been designed to de-escalate, to try to bring the tensions down. Uh, and obviously this attack, very, very serious, uh, certainly escalatory on the behalf of, uh, of these militia groups. We, we have to take that seriously and we will. CNN's Natasha Bertrand starts us off from the Pentagon. Natasha, what are you hearing? Dana, this is obviously something that the administration had been dreading, given that there had been over 150 Iran-backed attacks on U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq and Syria since October, with the goal, U.S. officials say, of killing American service members. And we are learning that three U.S. Army soldiers did uh, were killed in this drone attack. More than 30 were wounded, including eight who had to be medically evacuated because their injuries were so serious. Now, we are learning a little bit more this morning about just how this occurred, how this drone managed to make its way uh, into this base and hit near the living quarters of this facility. We are told that an American drone, which was returning from a mission, was approaching the base at around the same time that the enemy drone was approaching. The enemy drone followed the American drone onto the base and it delayed the U.S. response because there was some confusion over whether that enemy drone was in fact an enemy rather than an American drone. And so all of this is contributing to the picture U.S. officials now have of what happened here. But still, as you said, the U.S. doesn't know which group was responsible exactly uh, for this attack. Now, President Biden is under increasing pressure to respond and respond forcefully. Even presidential candidate Nikki Haley is weighing in on this, saying that the U.S. needs to hit back hard. Here's what she said. The very first strike that hit, you punch and you punch back hard. What they should be doing is going after every ounce of production of those missiles. Wherever those missiles are, you take that out. You Just keep doing, you does take out the training sites. You go and you But does that risk escalating a war? Does, these does that mean striking Iran directly? It means striking the resources that are allowing them to hurt our troops. That's what you're doing. Now, it's worth noting that the Biden administration has done that before. They have attacked weapons manufacturing facilities in Iraq and Syria that they believe the Iran-backed groups are using to stage these attacks on U.S. forces. Uh, however, the question remains of whether the U.S. is going to take that step of striking inside Iran directly. It does not appear that that is the most likely option at this mm. point, but certainly the president is coming under increasing pressure to do something very strong. He sure is. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that reporting. Joining me here, CNN National Security Analyst Beth Sanner and Peter Bergen. Uh, nice to see you both. Peter, I want to start with something that you wrote on CNN.com today. You wrote, since the war in Gaza began, Biden's administration officials have been saying multiple versions of we got this and have been working hard to contain any wider conflict. The burgeoning regional conflict now involves 10 countries, Jordan, Iran, Israel and Syria, Iran's proxies in Iraq, Lebanon and Yemen, Pakistan and the U.S. and the U.K. and four major terrorist groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis and ISIS. I mean, that lays out the scope, the breadth of the players that we're talking about here, very foreboding. Yeah, I mean, they've been saying for a long time, we don't want the regional conflict to widen. Now Bush has, uh, Biden has a terrible dilemma, which is uh, how do you respond without just making it a bigger conflict? Uh, and they've, as, as Natasha said in her report, they've already responded. They've blown mm -hmm. up ammunition depots and stuff. They've killed leaders of these groups. So what do you do? Um, and you know, one potential avenue is you know, massive cyber, cyber attacks, perhaps, that are deniable. Uh, but you know, if you're not going to attack Iran, what are you going to do? Um, and so we'll see. But uh, you know, obviously, what they sought to avoid has happened. Uh, and you know, as you say, uh, 10 countries are now involved in different ways and four major terrorist groups. Beth, you were deputy DNI, director of national intelligence. Take me inside what this kind of meeting is like, or meetings yeah. are like right now inside the National Security right. Council. Well, there are multiple meetings, right? And in each of these meetings, what, you, what everyone in the room is considering is, what are the range of options? What's on the table? 
and what will be the reaction of the different parties to different options, both the immediate reaction and then this long-term idea of reestablishing deterrence. And I was around during the Soleimani strike mm -hmm. in January of 2020, um, briefing President Trump at that time. And, you know, the issue is that y you have to understand that it's not about just one strike. It has to also be deterrence isn't about one act. Four months, three months after the Soleimani attack, two U.S. servicemen were killed and a mm -hmm. U.K. soldier in a strike inside of Iraq. So these things, you know, you have to do short term and you have to do long term. Well, let me uh, show you some of what the uh, more hawkish members of Congress are saying that uh, the president should do in the short term. Um, Pre Senator Wicker, strike directly against Iranian targets and its leadership. Senator Lindsey Graham, strike targets of significance inside Iran. Senator Cotton, devastating military retaliation against Iran's terrorist forces. Cornyn, target Tehran. So you have uh, those pretty, uh, again, hawkish Republicans, but powerful voices when it comes to foreign policy. Then let's just stick with the Republican uh, party for a second, because this is uh, quite interesting. Then you have those who are more in the sort of Donald Trump, America first wing of the GOP, which have a growing influence in the GOP. Nancy Mace, let's listen to what she said uh, this morning. This is all Joe Biden's fault. And it's ironic because the same people on the left, the same Democrats who said that Donald Trump would start World War III are the exact same people on the left who are literally trying to start World War III. If Biden wow. is going to go after Iran and do strikes or cause a war, he better come to Congress and, and make his case and get our approval. Peter? Well, the Republican Party is divided. But, I mean, to pick up on what Beth just said, I mean, you couldn't do anything bigger than killing Soleimani. He's the leader of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, the leader of the Quds Force. He was the most important military leader in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, the Trump administration, you know, killed him. Did that deter Iran? No. <laughs> so, I mean, so, like, you've got to look at the facts here a little bit and say, just saying we're going to have to take out their leadership. Well, it didn't deter them last time. So, uh, you know, what will deter them this time? I, you know, who knows? I mean, that's a subject of intense debate. Yeah. Uh, but they're not, they haven't been that well deterred, nor the Houthis, nor anybody else. Uh, and, we, you know, the other question is, you, as you go up the escalation ladder to try and get dominance, at what point does you, you escalate so far that it is World War III? Exactly. I mean, I think that going for Tehran, for example, is such an easy talking point from someone who's not actually going to be held responsible for that decision. You know, when you're sitting in these meetings and mm -hmm. you're thinking about and discussing the implications of these actions, you know, the person sitting behind that Oval Office desk is responsible, ultimately. And so I, I kind of consider this, you know, free-for-all in these pot shots aren't mm -hmm. serious. They're not serious. If you take that strike to Tehran now, what do you have left? You mentioned World War III, and that's sort of something that not a lot of people are saying out loud. You've covered uh, conflicts and terrorist groups. In fact, thank you for gifting me with these books. <laughs> um, the dollar off because I signed. Thank you. I know, with the signatures. <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, put this in the sort of context of what we've seen in the Middle East over the past, I don't know, two decades, three decades more, and how your level of concern is on that meter. Yeah, I mean, I'm just picking up, when I, World War III was simply picking yeah. up what May said. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, this is as big a deal as the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, which had all sorts of unintended consequences. That's, uh, by the way, that's a big statement. Well, I mean, we're at that point, right? I mean, if, if there were really 10 countries involved, either as, you know, carrying out attacks, being the subject of attacks, you know, this thing is not, it's like the frog that is slowly, in that slowly boiling pot of water. Uh, at what point do you say, yeah, we really are in a regional conflict? I think we are. Final word. You agree? Well, we're not over in terms of the risk of escalation. Hezbollah today, 10 attacks inside northern Israel. That is the next point, and it's different than this.